Good morning. While it's still morning. Okay, um, I was given a task. I was not just asked to come and speak. I was actually given a, a, a job to do. Will you come and teach about Reese Howells? And, and uh, I love this topic, but let me, let me just start off, and I want to ask for some real honesty in the room. I've, since I got here yesterday afternoon, I've heard the name Reese Howells tossed out over the microphone maybe 30 times. Okay, and everyone's like, yeah! On, All right, so be very honest right now. How many of you have read the book, Reese Howell's Intercessor? Raise your hand. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, so put your hands down. Um, let's reverse that. How many of you have never read the book? Okay, David, this is why you asked me to come and teach <laughs> and not preach. Uh, and because I would love to come and preach. Preaching's easier. Teaching's hard. <laughs> and uh, and I was, I've, I've, I've struggled. Since David called me, I had an immediate yes. It was, as soon as you called me, you called me, you had me at hello. But, uh, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's been a very difficult handful of weeks since that initial call because to try to take a man's life like Reese Howells, to try to take his life and cram it into the next hour is, is almost a sin. And it's really it, close to impossible to do it. So I have put something together just for you. And uh, I've, I've I've never done this before. I've been on a steady diet of Reese Howells for the last 16 years. I'd never heard of him until I got to D.C. and joined with Lou uh, at the beginning of J-Hop. I was thrown in headfirst into the school of prayer and was in meetings just like you where I started hearing the name Reese Howells getting tossed out over the microphone and everyone's going, yeah, you know, and I'm like, wow, who's that? <laughs> So somewhere along the way, I picked up this book, Reese Howell's Intercessor. And, um, and I, I misread it for the first couple of years. I thought there was an apostrophe S in there, Reese Howell's Intercessor, like it was about somebody else and who was the intercessor for Reese Howell's. No. Reese Howell's Intercessor. It's Reese Howell's colon, Intercessor. <laughs> So I got this book, and I, 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 I must tell you, like, I have been possessed by this man's story. Now, here's one of the things you, you might have caught last night, and this might be new to you, but you, you might have felt it burning last night, listening to Lou preach. Is, Lou is a man who is possessed with his own story. This is a man who found his name in the book. Okay, he's he's read, he's said, God, show me the diary, and he's found his name in the book. And the call is to each and every one of us to find your name in the book. Become possessed by your own story that God is telling through your life. Seriously. We all need to do that, but at the same time, I believe God has given us these incredible gifts, these examples. These gifts to the body of Christ, these apostolic leaders, Nazarites, that, that we can look to. They are memorial stones for us, but we can, they're more than just something to remember. I believe that there's something in them that, that, that go beyond just being a memorial stone. On, yeah. and, and Reese Howells is one of these guys. I'm, 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 I'm appealing to you right now. You have to give yourself to the story of this man's life. What I'm going to do in the next hour is just introduce you to it. But here's the thing. You can't understand his you can't understand the man if you don't understand the times that he lived in. That's right. See, we're all products 
of the times that we live in. You're all being shaped by, by cultural forces that are pressing in from every direction from the moment you're born until the day that you die. And your life will shift and change throughout different seasons, but you have been fashioned for such a time as this. And what happens with Reese Howes a lot is that we mostly just talk. Listen, that book is 37 chapters. We most, most of the stories that we tell about Reese are in the last three chapters. Because, wow. <laughs> yeah, the first, the first 30, all 37 chapters are hard. <laughs> it's the first 30 something is really hard. And then you get into where, like, it's like an action movie, you know? And you just get all action scene after action scene and stuff's blowing up and cool guys are walking away from explosions, you know? <laughs> All that kind of stuff's going on. So, but, but this is what happens is most of the time we just talk about the content of the last three chapters of the book. But you have a man who lived 71 years. And I, I began to think about this. And uh, for years, our, our group in Washington, D.C., we, we were just always finding ourselves talking again and again about Reese Howells. And then you'd walk away from it and you think, all right, I'm done with that book. And sure enough, God brings that book back off the shelf. Therese has to snatch it out of your hands and throw it across the room. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't a joke. That's a true story. <laughs> look, she's smiling. Look at her. <laughs> she, she, made, she wants to dial it down. But, so let's just say she slapped it against the wall. <laughs> I love you, honey. <laughs> She pushed him to the ground, <laughs> wrenched the book out of his hand, poured gas on it, struck a match, and she was the cool person walking away from the explosion. <laughs> so dramatic. But, you know, we would always come back to this story. And it would always end with like some version of this statement. Man, somebody should make a movie about that. And, and everybody would go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then we got possessed by it again. And in 2016, uh, we decided, you know, let's, let's do like an intensive internship to introduce as many people as we can to Reese Howells and what we included in that was actually a trip to Wales. So we did teaching and training in D.C., and then we went over the pond to Wales and spent a week at the Bible College of Wales, which is the ministry school that he started in 1924. Listen, that school had, had, it had thrived through decades, but then had fallen into disrepair, had closed. It was going to be demolished, and a church from Singapore came in at the... 11th hour and saved this thing, poured resources into it, saved it. And guess who the first people were to stay there? Me and Elise. <laughs> this is Elise here. She was, she was a part of that intensive uh, when we went there. Um, I don't know. It, it blessed my heart. We were the first group to stay at the newly opened Bible College of Wales. They had staff there, but we were the first outsiders to come. It felt like a milestone for me. But we met, you know, amazing former students that were teaching and, and spoke to us there. And then we met some of the older, you know, the oldest ones, you know, that had the most history. And when we left, uh, you know, a couple of them were in their 90s, late 80s, somewhere in there. It's all a blur at that point. And uh, we left and we went, man, somebody should make a movie about that. And God was like, you're right. And we still didn't do anything with it. And there was a man that we met there, and his name was Richard Mayton. And he's, he goes way, way back. He had just written this book called Samuel Reese Howells. A Life of Intercession. This is Reese Howell's son who took over for Reese. He had just written this book, and we got to hear him teach. And I was just, I was so gripped by the stories that this man told. 
And, um, but still, we didn't do anything with it. And two years went by. You know, two years can go by like that. And in December of 2018, we got that Richard passed away. And that was a gut-wrenching thing to hear for me because when, you're, when they're gone, the stories go with them. And it's like, yeah, we have a written record. Yeah. But you know what I mean? Like there was, at least you remember when, when, we, were, when we were in the room with him. There was something, and it's like you were touching something, and uh, oh, I I mourned over that. I mourned, I grieved at the loss of this man. I'm I'm happy that he's with Jesus, but I mourned over the stories that were never written and the ones that he just told verbally. You know, the oral history of intercession and shifting the nations, and that's really what kicked me in the pants, and so. We uh, went into 2019, and we started making a film. It is a documentary. We might have a battery problem here. And um, uh, I want to show you the trailer for it. Because if you could uh, pull up the Vimeo video, we're going to play that in just a minute here. Um, we, we, we set about this huge task that I'm going to try to do in a presentation with you this morning, but it's this thing that you can't just tell people, you know, this is what Reese House did. You have, to, you have to help people understand the times that he lived in. So the movie about Reese House became the life and times of Reese House so that you understand that he was a product of his times. I'll stop talking now. If we can go ahead and play the trailer. That would be great, and make sure the volume's turned up. There was an awareness throughout Wales of something wonderful happening. The churches were full day and night. People walking on the streets would come under the conviction of sin. There wasn't much preaching of the Holy Spirit was taking over. And people came from all over the world to see what was happening here. They then took the gospel back to their own countries and took revival back. I think that the Welsh Revival is one of the most dramatic spiritual awakenings. It impacted everything. Somebody like Rhys Howells took that into the place of prayer, that faith and that perseverance, and even greater wonders took place. It's like ripples coming over you, ripples of cleansing coming over you. And then it just ended up into a crescendo of praise. It is through the church that God wants to make known his manifold wisdom. God raises up intercessors like that to be a pastor over the world. The German air power has been brought so close to our island that what we used to dread greatly has come to pass. Few would have believed we could survive. It was a cruel time, but it, things could have been a lot worse had God not stepped in when he did, you know. You have the testimony of the prophets that something terrible is coming. You have just the evidence of recent history. I mean, World War II was yesterday in terms of what modern civilized man is capable of. Every time you go from a unipolar world to multipolar world, you have world war, and it instantly stops the spread of the gospel. So what does that tell us for this short season we have before the world goes multipolar? Before 
the dawn of this new age, the Bible is very clear that there are birth pains. And if we are to navigate the days ahead, if we think we can do it without abiding in the vine, without having a genuine, deep prayer life, we're deceiving ourselves. But it's most often those that run toward the conflict that are actually going to see the greatest harvest. The gospel has not gone to every single people group on earth. So right now, if we go to heaven, if we pay a visit to the throne of God, they will still be empty spaces. The prayer and the missions movement are dynamically connected with one another. The man that's leading the Great Commission is the same man who's leading the global prayer movement. There's never been a church planting movement in history without a prayer movement. And so without prayer, uh, there is no way, absolutely no way, we can go to the unreached. But with prayer, we can literally change the course of history. There are periods that the, the tide has been out. But guaranteed, in so many hours, the tide will come in again. It's got a little something on it. Um, we, we filmed just enough to, to cut this trailer. There's a little bit more, but oh, there's a lot more actually. But you know, there's a lot more that is yet to be filmed and we were about to move into our next phase. We had our airplane tickets bought and then COVID hit. And I found myself sitting in quarantine at the beginning of last year wondering, God, why is this being delayed by a global pandemic? <laughs> it, it was, it's painful because we were just, you know, we've, we've, we've been invested in this for so long. But things are starting to open up again now in terms of being able to travel. And, and you know, the hardest part is not so much, you know, Getting to a place or having to wear a mask or not, the, the issue was that almost all of our interviewees are extremely elderly. And, you know, it's like, do you really want that responsibility in a time of pandemic that you want to press your own, you know, uh, priorities with, with a 90-year-old? It's not a good idea. So we've been waiting. Uh, in November, I was... Uh, with uh, a group of prophetic folks uh, uh, with Cindy Jacobs. Is she speaking tonight? Amazing. And uh, Cindy prophesied over this film. And she, I'm taking this one to the bank because it's Cindy Jacobs. And uh, she, she said, this film will go around the globe. This will start a new prayer movement and it will touch Israel. So we've spent a lot of time digging into this. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to walk you through. I put a little presentation together, and I'm going to walk you through a timeline to help you understand the times that Reese House lived in. Some of this is going to tie in with what you heard from Fred Markert, the human fire hose, <laughs> yesterday. Does anybody remember anything that he said? Or do you only remember the experience of being here? <laughs> Here's the thing. This is the way this kind of stuff works. In moments when God is on a company of people like I believe he is here, uh, you know, maybe you don't have the best attention span. Maybe, maybe you don't have the best memory. It doesn't matter. Like right now, like when you go into a meeting like this, just say, God, if there's just one or two things that you want me to, to grasp, 
one, it, one or two things that, you, you, that I have to remember out of this. I'm just, I pray for myself right now, God, that I, that I wouldn't miss that. And this is one of those things. I'm about to deluge you with information. And here's what I did as a gift. This is a freebie. Uh, I, I, I started to put dates with all of this historical stuff. And I looked at it. I, I got a few minutes into it. And I was like, this is a horrible idea. <laughs> Because I know y'all slept through history class just like me. What was history class? History class was about memorization. And what did you do? You, you, you did a, a, a crash memorization thing uh, the, you know, uh, the night before a test. And you'd fill your noggin with all of these useless facts and dates so that you could vomit it out the next morning on the test and then never remember it again. So... Somebody was in class with me. So here, here's the deal. I, I, I took out as mi- all, the, all of the specific dates, most of them actually. So don't worry about that. You don't have to remember the dates. What, I'm a visual learner. If you can show me something, I can, I can remember it a lot better than if you tell me a date and expect me to memorize it. And so I, what I did, and I've never done this before. This is just for you guys. I tried to vis- I'm going to visually show you the timeline of Reese's life and stand it up against world events so that you can see how they correlate and you can see how they uh, line up. And I'm hoping that that will make an impression on your memory. All right. Let's start here. <clears throat> this is Acts 13. It says, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Well, let's look at that in a different translation. This is the New King James on the bottom. Same scripture. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. I want you to Observe something here with me real quick. These two scriptures are translated differently. The first says that David served the purposes of God. The other one says that he served his own generation. So which is it? What did David do? Did he serve God's purposes or did he serve his generation? I think that this is actually a big question that that you as... Okay, how many... I just want to understand who's in the room. If you're a millennial, raise your hand. Millennials. <laughs> if you're Gen Z, raise your hand. Okay, it's, it's almost equal. If you're Gen X and you're representing, raise your hand. <laughs> I just, I kind of wanted to know, you know, who's in the room because we've, you know, we've, we've easily, we have four generations in this room right now represented. And if you were listening, I don't know if Fred talked about it in the morning session or not, when he's going through his cycles, uh, generational cycles uh, have four rotations. So even in this room right now, we have a full rotation represented in, in, of generational cycles because there are four here, the boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z. But one of the, I think this is a big question that, the, that particularly millennials and Gen Z need to be asking because I've preached for the last decade that I believe the millennials in particular were pre-programmed by God for justice. Believe, I believe it. I, I have seen the evidence of it, and I've preached it. The problem is, I think that calling got hijacked. I still think you're programmed for justice. It's just that you got hijacked, and I think that there's this idea that we're going to serve our own generation. Apart from serving the purposes of God. So this is a big question right here. Which is it? Let's break this down. A little bit. So the word served here, the verb, the action part of this statement, what did David do? He served. 
Very strange word. When you, to understand the, in Greek what that word means is it's, it's to be an under rower. Do you know what an under rower is? Of course you don't. An under rower, so this is a Roman ship, and you got like, you know, the guys up on deck getting a suntan, uh, but then you've got these guys down underneath. This one has, you know, three different layers of it. The lower under rowers, the middle and the upper, but that's an under rower. If you look down in the bottom left hand corner, an under rower is the guy that's down in the bottom of the boat sitting on an uncomfortable wood plank rowing so that that boat can go somewhere. Let's zoom in, get a better look at that guy that's down in the, the corner. Look at him. He loves it down there. It's great. It's hot. It's sweaty. It smells really bad. There's no bathrooms. But look at him. He's happy just to be a part of God's plan. This is the moment everyone will talk about, about contend 2021. <laughs> at Contend Global. So, so when it says that David served, the picture that's given is that, here's, come on, David's king. This is the guy that took out Goliath. This is the guy that sets up the tabernacle. Come on. No, in his generation, what, uh, what, what is said of him is that he got down in the lowest part of the boat and started rowing. David did, but now there's another part of it. It says, by the purposes of God. Here's how you need to understand this. If you, if you look at the language there, the purpose of God is the same as, it can also be translated, the counsel of God. So let me answer the question for you. Do you serve the purposes of God or do you serve your own generation? The answer is that you serve your generation by serving the counsel of God. This is what you must do, is understand the times that you are living in and what God is saying about these times right now. Give yourself to that counsel, and this is how you serve your generation. Arthur Wallace said it best, if you would do the best with your life, find out what God is doing in your generation and throw yourself wholly into it. That's what David did. He served the counsel of God. He understood what God wanted to do in his generation. And he was willing, even though he was king, he was willing to get down and go as low as possible just to put a hand on the oar and start rowing. Listen, the same, if it was, if it was, as, if it was good enough for David, it's certainly good enough for you. Don't back away from being willing to go down to the lowest, the lowest part, just to put a hand on the oar of what God wants to do right now. It's like what Fred, Fred's material is, it's overwhelming, but I've been on a, a two-year Fred Markert diet. It'll get you in shape. No, I because you got to... Let it sit in your spirit and, and, and don't run away from it. Because this, this is what's needed right now. What he was saying yesterday afternoon about how a generation is trying to serve, they're trying to serve themselves by instituting institutional change. I hope you heard what he said, that that's not going to work. There are no historical examples that that's going to work. And there is no scriptural principles that that's going to work. So... Don't, the, 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 uh, the urge to hear Fred's message is to just be like, man, that's too much. And you just want to back away from it. Listen, give yourself to it. I'm appealing to you. Give yourself. I'm, I, it is wisdom that you had Fred here. 
for this moment in time. Because you have to understand what God wants to do right now. And social media is not going to tell you the counsel of God. If anything, it's going to tell you the exact opposite. So the onus is on you to find out what is God doing in your generation. I like these boys here. David is in Hebron. He's about to be elevated to be king of all of Israel. And these guys, the sons of Issachar, they come to join him in the wilderness of Issachar. Men who had understanding of the times. Do you know how valuable that is to, to, to leaders? How valuable that is to anybody that needs to make a decision. You need to be that person. You serve your generation by serving the counsel of God so that at the appointed time, there will be a day of your appearing. When God brings John the Baptist in before Herod to declare the counsel of God. And he didn't want to hear it. And it cost him his head. But, listen, the onus is on you to know what the message is. That If you have the message, God has this funny way of getting you where you need to be at just the right time. Oh, so much to say about that. All right. That's a lot of preamble, isn't it? We're going we're gonna to get into the life of Reese House. So Reese House, born in 1879, died in 1950. Now, there is an uncomfortable and inconvenient truth that is universal for all of humanity that you must understand at the very beginning of this story. And it is the scientific fact that your ears will grow throughout your lifespan. (laughs) And Reese Howes is a blazing example of this truth. All right. So here's a snapshot. Uh, Let's just hit some high points. Now, I know, I I wasn't sure how big these screens are, so I apologize. You probably can't read that, can you? I'm so sorry. That is hard to read. Okay. So just just to kind of run through this, I want you to see this here. So Reese Howes, he's born in 1879. In, you know, uh, 1902, he... Moves to America. See, he, he, he grew up, he was uh, working in a tin mill in Wales. And uh, he wants, he's a young man. He, it's time to make his fortune and make a name for himself. America was the land of promise. So he comes to America and ends up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and starts working in a tin mill there, starts making good money. He's doing okay for himself. In uh, 1903, he gets saved. Praise God, this is awesome. Uh, immediately after he gets saved in 1904, he moves back to Wales. He feels like God wants him to go back to Wales. So he goes back. He's there where he grew up, where his family is. 1906, uh, he gets filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a high point. Um, shortly after, uh, what, like 1910, so he gets married to Elizabeth. They have a son. They name him Samuel. Uh, they leave him. With a relative, but Reese and Elizabeth go uh, to the mission field for five years. They're uh, missionaries in Africa, so it's great. They do a little bit of missionary work. That's awesome. They come back. He starts a ministry school called the Bible College of Wales. A little bit later, he gets a vision for the future called the Every Creature Vision. He even writes a book, and then he dies in 1950. The end. There you go. That's the life of Reese Howes. Isn't that exciting? Admirable, right? Like that, wouldn't you aspire to be that if you're in ministry? Get married, have kids, start a ministry school, get a vision for the future, maybe write a book. (laughs) Pretty cool, huh? (laughs) All right, let's put a little context in this. All right, you guys all know what the SVM is? All right, I just want you to see it so you can understand the relationship. So the Student Volunteer Missions Movement, that's what's in blue. So his life is overlapping uh, the entirety of the SVM. 
Now, the SVM is uniquely a, a, a missions movement out of the United States, but I just, you know, we're going to talk about a story out of Wales, all right? We're going to, a lot of what we discuss today is going to be focused on Europe, um, but I wanted you to see it because I know you guys pray for a new SVM a lot, so it's just good to see it in context. All right, so right here, boom, the Welsh Revival. In the trailer, we start with the story of the Welsh Revival in 1904. This goes on for a couple of years. You can't tell the story of Reese Howes without telling the story of revival. You can't tell the story of Wales without telling the story of revival. Do you, do you realize that Wales has experienced more revivals than any other place on the planet. What is it about that land? More revivals in Wales than anywhere else on the planet. So much so that, that there was an expectation that every decade a new, a fresh wave. That's when Alan Ebenezer says at the, at the end that, that the tide would go out, but then the tide, sure enough, it was so reliable, the tide would come back in again. They had had a revival in 1879, I think. And then all of a sudden, 1889 comes around, no revival. 1899 comes around. It's now been 20 years, no revival. Something's going on. People in Wales knew something is wrong. The church was falling into apostasy. They needed a revival. But sure enough, in God's perfect timing, the tide comes in, 1904, Evan Roberts, do we, you guys study revivals? No, no, you don't. You need to study revival. Get yourself on a steady diet of historic revivals because it will make your stomach ache for one of your own. It'll make you hungry. It's like smelling good food that's being cooked and you just want to eat it. This is what it's done to me. So anyway, so we have the Welsh revival here. And um, oh, let me just take a minute. I, 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 this was a last-minute edition th this morning, but David gave me permission to go till noon tomorrow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and interject this. Um, if you could pull up that YouTube video. This is audio only. So the Welsh... Wales, it is the land of song. There's something about the land and the connection of the people to the land. There's sing-songy people. When they talk to you, there is just a song. Like, it's just, I'm not impersonating it very well, but if you talk to a Welsh person, like, there's a song in them. And, and, and revival would come to Wales, and the song would get released, and the, the sound of 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 Revival would go out and it would touch the whole globe. But uh, the, really the foremost authority on Welsh history and revival is Ray Hughes. Nobody, Ray Hughes goes to Wales to teach them about their own history. It's pretty interesting. And, and I, was, I was talking to Ray about this and I was like, you know, what is it? And, you know, are the, you know the, the songs. And, and he said, I just want you to hear it. Now, I don't know if it's going to affect you the same way it affects me, but Ray sent me this. He said, this, this is Celtic, but he said that this, at this time in history of the Welsh Revival, guys, there were no light shows and smoke machines and electric guitars. The people were the instruments. The power of Welsh Revival was the, the sound of heaven filtering through human beings and affecting the earth. So we're, I want to play just a little clip. I don't know if I'm going to play the whole thing, but I want you to close your eyes and just listen to a couple of minutes of this. Ray sent me this, and he said, you have to understand, this is what it sounded like during the Welsh Revival. So everybody, close your eyes right now. There's no picture. This, it's just audio. This is a congregation singing Psalm 22. Turn it up, please.
That's just a little taste. That's what whales sounded like when Reese, he gets saved in a meeting in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, when a Messianic Jew named Maurice Rubin preached the cross. I believe it created a, a soul debt in Reese that he had to repay, he spent the rest of his life repaying. It was at the preaching of an apostolic Jew in Pennsylvania. He was an oddity. I found the newspaper articles about him. Converted Hebrew is what they re referred to him as. 1903, he ends up in a little Methodist chapel. I found the building. It's a deli now. But I found the building that Reese got saved in. We're going to put it in the film. But he, he gets saved and immediately he, he knows God wants him to go back to Wales with this message. And he gets back just in time for the Welsh revival of 1904 to begin. So Reese gets caught up in these two years of revivals. And guys, it, it, it's, it's a gross error to attribute that revival to Evan Roberts. Yes, God used him in a powerful way, but it wasn't a one-man revival. Revival was breaking out in places Evan Roberts wasn't. There was a sound that was getting released. I, just, I could go on and on and on, but you just have to understand that Reese comes out of that land. You know what I'm saying? Like the, 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 and, and, and the Welsh revival, 1906, uh, uh, Evan Roberts starts corresponding with this guy over in Los Angeles. And the Azusa Street Revival explodes in 1906, but it has direct connections to this revival. You, you see the shock waves, like reverberating and going out all around the globe. People were, what is it? The sound gets released. Pe guys, there was, like you're not getting on an airplane back then. It was costly, but people would still go. They would make their way to Wales to experience this and get a deposit of what God was doing in that generation. And as Alan said in the trailer, they would take it back to their own nation. So revival gets transplanted. It touches India. It touches Korea. All around the globe. Had a tremendous impact on America. There's a couple of guys that were even like, uh, they went before Evan Roberts and uh, the, 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 uh, the Joshua boys. Joshua brothers. Seth Joshua and his younger brother Frank Joshua. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? One hand, two hands. That's great. Seth Joshua was the guy that was preaching in the chapel when Evan Roberts was praying, God bend me. Seth was the guy preaching. But Frank... Frank was more of a pastoral type. Seth was, he was a pugilist. He was a boxer. <laughs> and he was a burly man and had a boisterous way of preaching. But his brother Frank was more pastoral. And all of these men, this is the thing that, I've been in that chapel that the Joshua brothers built. And you know, it doesn't look like our churches. 
It didn't look like the ch- many of the churches back then either. They were the first ones to build like these in-the-round churches where the congregation went all around. And I was talking with the pastor that was there. He's like, you have to understand. You see where that pipe organ is right now? He said, that was all men. The choirs were men. Now, it's not to say that women weren't, weren't singing as well, but there was something. Guys, it, I, I have a longing in my heart that we just don't see men doing this anymore. <laughs> But he's like, you have to understand, like, the choir loft, it was all men. And Frank was pastoring and discipling all of these young men that were being swept into the revival. Then what happened? Boom. World War I and World War II. So I'm dropping those in because I want you to see that We're talking about the Welsh Revival in 1904. World War I breaks out in 1914. In 10 short years, the whole earth was going to shift. See, up until World War I, it was actually noble and honorable to go off and fight war. Right? You'd be part of a cavalry, you know, you're riding on a horse. What's different about World War I is we started that thing in 1914 on horses, and we ended it in 1918 in tanks. In four years, there was this massive shift of technology of how to mutilate a human body. And that's why they called it the war to end all wars. It was called the Great War. They didn't call it World War I back then. They thought this was the end of the world. It was the Great War. But all of those boys that Frank had been discipling, guess where they went? They found themselves in the trenches doing trench warfare in France. Right on the Somme. And of, I just as an anecdote, this is what I'll do as we go through the timeline. i just tell you the stories that are in my head. And I don't, a lot of this I don't have planned. But I'm, I'm talking with these, these guys that have restored their... Pre- they're preserving that, that church that the Joshua brothers built there in Neath, Wales. And they said that Frank saw every one of those young men off at the train station. As a spiritual father, only one of them came back. Of all the ones that went, only one came back. It broke his heart so much that he died right after World War I, and many say that he died of a broken heart. And this is what they described to me. They said, you see up there where the pipe organ is? All the men died in that war, almost all of them. And the sound of wails went silent. That thing that we were just listening to, this history of this generations of revival sound, it all went silent in four short years because all of those men died and they had to replace it with something. So instead of the men in the choir loft, they put pipe organs in there with one woman playing. Isn't that interesting? I want you to understand when, I, I only emphasize it like that because when, when Fred stands right here yesterday, It's a slap in the face when he says, oh, yeah, World War III in the next three or four years. Like, how do you even process a statement like that? But I'm looking at, like, this history of revival and, man, this was a revival just to prepare men to go to heaven. All of those young men. So in my time over there in Wales, we went into all these small villages. And everywhere you go and in every church that you go into, one of the first things you see is a plaque with the names of all the young men from that village that got killed in World War I. Every church we went into had one of those plaques. It devastated the, the nation and England and Scotland, all of it, Ireland as well. So I want you to see Reese Howe's life. It overlaps with World War I and World War II. Now, just for fun, to connect in with Fred's content yesterday, just so you can see it, 
Did you catch that thing he pitched about unipolar, multipolar, and bipolar? Right, those, those rotations, those are geopolitical rotations that we have to be aware of and how they relate to the times and seasons that we live in. That's the shift right there. I want you to see it. So Reese's life spans all three where he's born during the Pax Britannica when Britain is the unipolar power. And, and no doubt that this is why the SVM was experiencing much success during those years because we were under a unipolar power. Many nations were open. And then all of a sudden, World War I ends the Pax Britannica and the whole globe shifts into a multipolar season and nations start shutting down. Money stops going to infrastructure and education and things and all the nations uh, start gearing up with a war machine because it's, it's like chum in the water during that time, right? You throw all the stuff in the water and here come the sharks. When there's not a unipolar uh, you know, superpower, then, then everybody's ready to pick a fight. That's, that's kind of the spirit of a multipolar season. And boy, isn't that sobering when he puts up the, the quote from then Vice President Joe Biden saying the goal of the Obama administration is to create a multipolar world. It's kind of an interesting statement. That's not me giving an opinion. That's me reading a quote. Okay? All right. You guys still with me? Okay. Good, because there's a lot more. <laughs> I have to speed up. All right, so let's get out of that. Let's sweeten the pot a little bit. Hey, I know. Let's throw in a global pandemic. The last global pandemic happened during Reese's life. It actually happened. The Spanish flu, 1918 and or, yeah, 1918, 1919, it happens while he's on the mission field. And if you read the book, you get, you get the stories, but every, I mean, people are millions and millions of people are dying around the globe. And he's on the mission field with very little access to, to medical supplies. He's in Africa. He's down in Gazaland, which is like there at Swaziland. It's close to the southern part of Mozambique. He's down there in the bush and gets uh, malaria, almost dies, and thinks he's going to die, but then all of a sudden, God's like, why don't you just believe for healing? And he's like, oh, yeah, and immediately gets healed. <laughs> but, he had, but he had come through, and he gained, you know, you'll hear this language in the book, that he gained the place of intercession. Then he knew that he had a claim on God for healing. And so he put the word out to all of these villages around where people are dying of the Spanish flu, saying, if you can make it here, you won't die. And here they came. And, and, and many, many, many were sick. But the testimony is that of all the people that came, none of those people died. They all recovered, including his wife, Elizabeth. All right. <laughs> you know, and I was wondering last year, God, I want to make a film about Reese House, but a global pandemic has delayed the whole thing. Why, God? I, I got really challenged by this because I was quarantined in my house trying to figure out how to do Zoom. And, and Reese was down in the bush with no medical supplies saying, if you can get here, you won't die. If you can get here. It's different today, isn't it? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out like what, the ch what just happened to the church. I'm not sure what just happened to the church. I think some pruning happened. I don't know that we increased in power or authority in the process. Maybe some did. All right, let's sweeten the pot some more. How about the Great Depression? 1929, the stock market crashes. It has global ramifications. And for almost a decade, the entire globe is in an economic depression. Now, that's going to be an important uh, 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 thing to kind of a bracket to have in the timeline because as we see later, as, as uh, Reese is entering into a, the prospect of buying property, 
at a time when nobody has any money. Like this, this is, it highlights the fact that he did this in faith. He didn't do it because of his business acumen. And my appeal to you is if you are a savvy business person, don't rely too heavily on your own skill and ingenuity. And young people, if you're in school and you're studying business, don't think you're going to escape what's coming because you're just somehow going to like have some spiritual smarts about you. No, we all are going to have to go through this next season in faith. Okay? Something's coming. This is why we're talking about this all right now. Something's coming, and we all need to learn a life of faith. And so I'm not going to talk any more about Reese's early life. I kind of want to find a place to jump into the timeline, and I'm going to choose that little window in between World War I and the Great Depression. We're going to start there, and then we're going to start. I want to focus on the last 25 years of his life, okay? All right, so here we go. World War I, the end of World War I, the other book in being the Great Depression that's coming. And we're going to just kind of look at this uh, in 10-year increments, okay? So uh, I mentioned that he was on the mission field in Africa. He literally missed World War I. <laughs> he missed almost the entirety. Here's, an, here's a fun story. Um, it starts in 1914, and there was all of this peer pressure going on in all those villages because it's honorable to go and fight for your country in war. And so if you're a young man and you didn't want to go fight in the war, the village would pressure you. When you would like get up and walk through the village in the middle of the day, they would all like look at you like, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be over there? And so I don't, there's no story that, that Reese had to deal with any of that, but 1915, he goes to the mission field. By, we're a year into World War I when he goes to the mission field. And the, I think this is a fascinating story. By that time, Germany had invented this really cool invention called a U-boat. Submarines. Okay? German submarines. And, and, and they were prowling the English Channel and the surrounding waters like wolf packs. And in the early stages of World War I, they basically declared war on all ocean-going vessels. They were going to, they're ready to pick a fight, okay? And so that sounds like a great time to get on a boat and go to Africa, doesn't it? Reese and his wife got on a ship and set sail right in the middle, like two months after the Lusitania was sunk by a German U-boat. And so there was panic and fear, and it was risky business, and they're on a ship with hundreds of other people, and they set sail, and there were, something happened. We don't know what, but the captain got spooked. I don't know if he saw something or became aware of something, but the captain is going to turn around and go back. And Reese goes to the captain and says, you have nothing to worry about. God has called me to Africa. <laughs> And the faith, and the, could you do the same thing? Have you gained a place in, in faith and in intercession that you can now take responsibility for a few hundred other people and say, nobody's going to die? He's, he puts faith in the captain, and the captain doesn't turn back, and they never saw a German U-boat. Or I should say the German U-boat never saw them. That's probably how it works. Fun story, huh? You don't know that from reading this book. You only know that detail by reading the book about his son who filled in that, that detail. I would highly recommend you read that book. All right, so 1920, Reese gets back from Africa. The war's over. The pandemic's over. His missions organization says... Uh, we need you to stay home now and tell the stories of revival because the revival that he had experienced in 1904, Reese took it to Africa with him. He told the Lord, he said, I'll go to Africa, but give me 10,000 souls. He saw it. 10,000 people got saved at his preaching down in Gaza land. 
And so he comes back with these extraordinary, uncommon stories of revival. And his missions organization says, we need you to put faith in the missions movement. And so he spends the next four years as an itinerant preacher telling the stories of revival. And man, wouldn't, we'd all love that, right? That's a fun job, right? That's a fun job to stay at home and just tell the fun stories. And uh, uh, I, I say it that way, a little tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, th- this was uh, that window of time in Reese's life. Now, just so you can see it, right there in June of 1924, that's when he founded the Bible College of Wales. All right, so let's, let's fill in a little more details around this. So after World War ended, 1919, uh, they... Uh, uh, they wrote the Treaty of Versailles. Now, this is a pivotal moment in European history, really in world history, because what they did was they laid... Germany wasn't solely to blame for World War I, but the Treaty of Versailles laid the debt at the feet of Germany, which was... It was a debt that they had no hope of repaying. And so uh, it, it, was a, it was a little bit of revenge in there, I think, but this, this basically ostracized Germany, you know, for a long time and created a lot of uh, ill will at home. Uh, uh, right after that uh, is when they formed the League of Nations. They're like, we got to make sure this never happens again. <laughs> so they formed the League of Nations. The United States is not a part of that, um, but that, it was a good idea. You know, let's, let's, let's just make sure that we're talking before we start shooting. Um, now, now it's going to get fun, right? Uh, right here, 1921, uh, within Germany, there's a lot of unrest. Like, it's revolution after revolution after revolution in Germany. Uh, lots of turmoil going on and financial catastrophe. And all of these political parties are rising up. One of them is called the Nazi Party. And this young... Uh, Buck named uh, Adolf Hitler. He's made the leader of that party. Mussolini uh, marches on Rome in 1922. All right, this is the beginning of his dictatorship in Italy. 1923, or it's actually like the very end, like around Christmas of 1922, uh, the Soviet Union is formed. And then uh, shortly after that happens, uh, Lenin dies, and this young guy, Joseph Stalin, takes his place. Stalin comes to power and begins his dictatorship right there at the beginning of 1924. Now, the reason I want you to see it like this is here's Reese back from the mission field, and he's coming back, and he's preaching revival. In the meantime, what's happening is... Actors are being set in place. Dictators, would-be dictators are rising. The international stage is shifting in this multipolar season. And I'm not putting this blame on him, per se, but I'll put it on us. Is When things are shifting, are we still stuck telling the stories of what God did in the past? Are we... Are we Busy, like, talking about revival while dictators are rising in the earth that are going to shut down the advancement of the gospel. This is what's taking place at this time right now where he's, he's going around preaching about the revival in Africa. Meanwhile, the, 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 the great villains of the 20th century are rising at the exact same time. So, end of 1923, this young guy, Hitler... Uh, again, there's a lot of turmoil going on in Germany. Lo- I mean, it's, it's kind of a free-for-all, right? There's a provisional uh, Weimar government that's been a- in place. It's not really getting much done. And so Hitler rises up, and he leads what's historically known as the Beer Hall Putz. <laughs> Do we have any Germans in here? Anybody that speaks German? All right, so it doesn't matter if I say it wrong. The beer hall puts the, the leaders of the, the governmental leaders were in this, this big beer hall, and he marches on the beer hall, a, a, a 
that's, Putz is the German word for coup d'etat. He's going to overthrow the government. It's a coup d'etat. And he fails. And he gets arrested. And so right here you can see that that next year, Hitler spends that year in prison. But guess what he did while he was in prison? He wrote a book called Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Do you see the proximity? See, something is shifting. Reese comes off the itinerary and begins to write articles and preach that we need, something's changing. The earth is different than it was. We need a new breed of missionaries that, can, that is up to this challenge. The only answer was to create a school that could teach them how to pray, not to avoid the obstacles, but to remove them or pray through them. This was Reese's answer to the global thing shifting is, is not to take the stage, so to speak, but to get a, a group like this together. Do you understand? The answer to the dictators rising in the earth was to get a group like this together and begin to train them and tell them, I'm sorry, but the old way isn't going to get this done. We need a new grade of missionary that can pray through these international obstacles. Well, I like this. Re, uh, Hitler gets out of jail and the New York Times. Uh, this might be the most epic fake news moment in all of history. Uh, they write this article. Hitler tamed by prison. This is real. Released on parole, he is expected to return to Austria. December 20th, Adolf Hitler, once the demigod of the reactionary extremists, was re uh, released on parole from imprisonment at Fortress Landsberg, Bavaria today, and immediately left in an auto for Munich. He looked a much sadder and wiser man today than last spring when he, with Ludendorff and other radical extremists, appeared before a Munich court charged with conspiracy to overthrow the government. His behavior during imprisonment convinced the authorities that, like his political organization known as the Volksscher, was no longer to be feared. It is believed he will retire to private life and return to Austria, the country of his birth. That's pretty epic, isn't it? 1924, we don't need to worry about Adolf Hitler anymore. Nine months in jail did the trick. Man, you talk about tone deaf. Or you talk about somebody who does not understand the times and seasons. They think nine months of sitting in a jail cell is going to tame this beast. Meanwhile, he's in there writing a book that is going to disciple the next generation. And so he's setting about the, the task of discipleship at the same time that Reese is like, we need to be about the task of discipleship. And I have to look at it this way. We, I've heard Lou preach this through the years, and it's true, is that as young men, Hitler would rise and look in the mirror, and he would practice his preaching but at the same time, there was another man named uh, uh, Churchill who would do the exact same thing. And these two foes would meet on the battlefield. I want to submit to you that in the spiritual realm, that spirit behind Hitler that is set about destroying the next generation in the globe and the Jews, Reese is meeting that challenge in the spirit with his own army. Do you see it? It's all happening at the same time. This is why, guys, you don't have the luxury of waiting a few years to see how this hashes out. And have somebody eat this food, digest it, and spoon it to you in a few years and tell you how this works. This is on-the-job training. you got to learn this right now, just like uh, the rest of us. Because it's all happening in real time. And it's all in the, like, if, if we could look at our own timeline in this kind of perspective, we'd see that all oh, this stuff is lining up at exactly the same moments. Meanwhile, the church is just trying to figure out how to do Zoom. So 
this okay, David? All right, let's slide down the timeline there. So restarts the Bible College of Wales. I'm bringing in that, that, uh, that book in just so you can see it. The Great Depression's coming, guys. We're in the, 19th, the last half of the 1920s. The collapse, the financial collapse is coming. Right? But remember, this is the Roaring Twenties. You, do you know your history? This is, this is when the flappers are dancing and music and jazz music is sweeping across America. These are good times. They felt like good times, but dictators are rising. And Fred even added yesterday that this is the same time frame in the 1920s when the Frankfurt School was saying, we've got a vision for the future. We're going to destroy this church. And we're going to bring the entire globe in under a different influence. This is when that was happening, is the, the Frankfurt School. But anyway, the, the Great Depression's coming. I want you to see this. So he founds the Bible College of Wales. Here's another fun story. It goes for one year, and then it shuts down. This is such a strange story. And, and I almost wish I didn't know it, but I, 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 I'm kind of glad that I do. Reese starts this school, and he begins to call these young people to a much higher level of consecration than what the culture says is okay and acceptable. Yeah, Reese, if you read the book, Reese had been led by God. Nobody preached it to him. He, was, he got to number six, and he took a Nazarite vow. Guys, you're cut from the same spiritual cloth as Reese Howes. Most of the church, you won't hear this in church. Most of the churches you go to, they've never even read number six. <laughs> but they have read Amos that you commanded the pro God says, I raised up prophets and Nazarites from among your young men. But you commanded the prophets not to prophesy and for the Nazarites to drink wine. Is this not so, saith the Lord? So the, he, he's calling these young people. And, and guys, here's the thing. St pray for your leaders. And refuse to get offended. Because we're all human. And we all make mistakes. And I don't know who's right and who's wrong. It's, it's, a, it's always a mixture, isn't it? But he starts the school and it goes for one year. And at the end of one year, there's a student... Who had, he got invited to participate in some competition. I think it was like a poetry competition or something. And, he, and, and the young man goes to the principal and says, can I do this? And the principal says, I think this is great. Yes, you can do it. And then when Reese heard about it, he shuts the whole thing down and says, this is worldliness. And by the way, why are all you young men smoking cigarettes? This is, this is real. He starts demanding that they not smoke. I don't know, I, at different day, right? Like, everybody smoked. You know, why can't they smoke? It's not that big a deal, right? Reese is like, no, you need to, you need to live a life that is not bound to the world. And, and, and he even went so far as to tell this young man, you can't, you can't be in it. And I've got a recording of an old man who was in the school that first year. It's decades old, and, and he's, he's recounting the story, and he said, he said, the principal and the entire student body gathered together and said, we have to stand together against this dictator. And they called him a tyrant. And the entire student body with the principal rose up against Reese Howes and they left. Who was at fault? I don't know. Was he too harsh? Maybe. Were they too worldly? Probably. But in the first year of God trying to actualize this thing, Hurricane Dennis comes in. You don't know what I'm talking about. And threatens this thing at the earliest stages. Because, you, you, come on, 
I just want to smoke cigarettes. You know what I'm saying? Can I, can, listen, are you Nazarites or not? If you want to make a difference, you have to be different. Tweet that. If you want to make a difference, you have to be different. Don't think you're going to do everything that everybody else is doing, but you're just going to somehow slide in the influence of the kingdom incognito. It does not work that way. The world's going to drag you down and along with everybody else. and You won't even know it's happening. So the school shuts down. One student, the guy that I was listening to on this recording, he's the only one that stayed. One student, four staff. <laughs> I feel pretty good right now. <laughs> I, I'm actually glad I do know the story because it's so relatable. And, and, it, and it, when everybody leaves, what are you going to do? So they stay. And for a year, they prayed, took care of the garden. So... A year later, 1926, the school reopens. And it never shut down again. I don't know. Some, God, God worked on Reese, and I think he worked on a generation. But meanwhile, the timeline's still moving forward. Now, again, the SVM is not connected to these, these things per se. But I just want you to see this in the context that it's in these years that Reese is trying to raise up a new grade of missionaries, that the SVM had hit its high point, and it is now tanking. Because countries are shutting down. This is what Reese meant when he said that anytime we shift to multipolar, the advancement of the kingdom gets stopped in its tracks. This is what he's talking about. So yeah, that, you can say, yeah, well, no, the SVM went on into the 1930s. Well, by 1932, it's toast. It's, isn't that interesting that they're still trying to hold it together? But as soon as that Great Depression hit and the money dried up, nobody had an answer. Meanwhile, Reese is over here buying estates with two pence in his pocket. You see the difference? What's so stunning to me is we've read the, the student missions movement. The movement stopped praying and moved to a social justice gospel. So in the wake of World War I, what happens is, uh, yeah, I, they, I guess they stopped praying. And, and uh, because the nations were shutting down and they could not go, they turned their focus inward and started focusing on social justice issues and the social gospel. Does this, does this sound familiar at all? Does this sound familiar at all? All right, so I just want you to see that by 1932, the SVM is toast. Somebody wrote about it in 1939 and said it's a thing of the past. But, so let's, that's all we're going to talk about the Great Depression. Let's kind of phase that out. I, I do want you to see there on the far right, 19, it's, it's Christmas Day, 1935. No, I'm sorry, Christmas Day, 1934. Reese wakes up at 3 a.m. saying every creature, every creature, every creature. He has a divine encounter with the Lord. He launches it on January 1st, 1935. This vision of the future, that the gospel must go to every creature and Jesus can come back to the planet and the millennial kingdom can begin. So I want you to see that's the moment of the vision. David, I'm trying to go fast. Now what's interesting, something else is going on. Now let's look at the bottom half of the, the, bottom of the timeline here. The same time that the Literally the same month that the BCW reopens, Hitler Youth is formed. Then what happens is Hitler, after his time in jail, he realizes we're not going to overthrow the government uh, with a coup d'etat. So you know what? We're going we're gonna to embrace this. And he enters politics he ends up running against Hindenburg for president. He loses. Hindenburg uh, gets reelected as president. But then Hitler is so popular that he covers himself by appointing Adolf Hitler as Germany's chancellor, his number two. Okay? 
What happens with the Hitler Youth is that in January of 1933, there are 100,000 Hitler Youth. By December, there are 2.4 million. This is shocking. This is shocking. So as missions is tanking, another ideology has come in. And just within the boundaries of Germany, by the end of the year of Hitler taking the stage at this level, there are 2.4 million Hitler youth. Something's coming. Something's coming. A generation is being discipled. All right, so... Slide down the timeline here, 1935. So you see, that's the every creature vision. <clears throat> this one's going to be a lot. So if you want to hold your photos until I'm done, uh, it'll help. So 1934, Hitler becomes Fuhrer, which means leader of Germany, when Hindenburg dies. Not a, not a great move, making Hitler your number two. You catch my drift. Hindenburg dies. Hitler ascends, gets rid of all the other titles, and declares himself Fuhrer. Remember Mussolini, that guy, that dictator down in Italy? He starts doing stuff. It's kind of funny with Mussolini. He, um, he was declaring that he, this is the new Roman Empire. The, 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 the reemergence of the Roman Empire, and everyone was like, um, can you be an empire if you only have one country? And he was like, oh, hey, are there any other countries left? Because colonialism had pretty much taken all of Africa. And he's looking around, and he's like, uh, there's one, Abyssinia, which is Ethiopia. Let's do that. <laughs> So he invades Abyssinia. He invades Ethiopia and begins a, a multi-month campaign. Now, it's interesting because God had spoken to Reese and, and the company at the BCW ahead of time that he had special plans for the gospel to advance in Abyssinia. And so they were praying. You know, you know why? Because it's Ethiopian Jews. They're black, but they're Jews. And the soul debt, I have to believe, it's the soul debt. Is, is it, it's helping shape his destiny. They begin to pray. God's telling them that he has special purposes for the advancement of the gospel with these Ethiopian Jews. So they're praying, and then Mussolini invades. And Reese is absolutely convinced that Italy is not to have Abyssinia. And so they're praying... Now, let's add this here. Um, Hitler is looking at that Versailles Treaty, and he's like, this is bogus. We're not doing this anymore. He breaks the Versailles Treaty with this big move when he reoccupies the Rhineland, which is this, this demilitarized area along the Rhine. And uh, he moves in there, and the whole globe is like, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody knew what was going on, but they have the recent memory of World War I, and they know they don't want that again. Right, So it's peace at all costs. And so he walks in there. Nobody stops him. This was a big moment. Now, one of the things I'm going to do in this slide is I want you to see, like if you read the, the book, Reese Howe's Intercessor, you'll pull out of this book, you'll highlight it, no doubt, statements that are made that pierce your heart. What I want to do is put some of those statements in the timeline so you can see what he's talking about. Hitler marches into the Rhineland unopposed. Reese knew that that was not supposed to happen, and they were praying for him to be stopped, but he wasn't stopped. And Reese walks into the prayer meeting and declares to the young people, prayer has failed. I wouldn't advise that unless it's the Lord. What a statement. Prayer has failed. Only intercession will avail. Now, I'm going to teach this afternoon, and, and I, I want to... I'm going to teach the way Reese taught it, the difference between prayer and intercession, okay? But most people don't understand that statement. That was on March 29th. Mussolini then, on May 5th, 
he takes Addis Ababa, he takes the capital of Abyssinia, and the emperor, a guy named Haile Selassie, he's known as the Lion of Judah, he's a Christian man. His original name was Ras Tafari. He's the, 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 the Africans in Jamaica that are Rastafarians. He's the guy that they all kind of model their religion on. They idolized him in a, in a non-godly way. Anyway, so Emperor ha- Haile Selassie, he goes into exile. He has to flee, and Italy now controls Abyssinia. And Rhys knew that that wasn't supposed to happen. And so that's when he comes into the meeting and he declares that this is the death in intercession. And when you study this topic of intercession, you come to the, you know, you'll encounter these, these ideas, these principles that the seed has to die before it, there can be resurrection. This is the event where they begin to understand that in intercession, something's got to die. The thing that you knew was supposed to happen did not happen. And you, you've, if you're carrying it and are responsible for, for what's going on, you, it feels like death, smells like death, it tastes like death. In some ways, I feel like this is what the prophetic prayer movement has gone through in this most recent season. I want you to see this. Look at this, man. God's so good in the midst of all this stuff. He comes and there's a month-long visitation of the Holy Spirit at the BCW. They referred to this as their Pentecost. On March 29th, when he declared that prayer has failed, that is, that is when, as a company of intercessors, they, they made a commitment. They saw their lives as being living sacrifices on the altar. And they may, see, here's the funny thing about living sacrifices. They have the urge to run away <laughs> when the knife comes up. That's, that's why Romans 12 is, it's, it's, if you think about it, it's actually a hard thing to swallow that we're to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. And they saw when they experienced the death and intercession, they said, this is when they declared, We are willing to become any cog in the machine. It's David saying, I'll be the under rower. They said, we're willing to lay our lives on the altar and become any cog in the machine for the gospel to go to every creature. But God's so good, he comes and he visits them. And Lou was talking about this yesterday, I guess. That's what I picked up last night. Is that it was during that month of the visitation of the Holy Spirit, their Pentecost, when they... he, they wrote, they said, we weren't being confronted with sin, we were being confronted with self. And for an entire month, three or four weeks, the Holy Spirit was so heavy on the school, it said that the students would catch themselves talking to each other in whispers and tiptoeing around the campus so as not to disturb the Spirit. It was such a holy visitation, and God was ridding a company of people of the influence of self and worldliness and self-preservation because something was coming. He needed a consecrated company that was up to the task of what was coming. All right, 1938. I'm so sorry this is taking so long. 1938, Germany annexes Austria. Nobody says anything. A uh, few months later, Germany occupies Czechoslovakia. Everyone is now freaking out. He's completely chucked the Versailles Treaty, but now it's looking like war is coming. And so everyone's scrambling. What are we going to do? Uh, Prime Minister of England was a guy named Chamberlain at the time. He, uh, along with the uh, uh, Prime Minister of France, they rush to Munich and they meet with a guy named Mussolini and a guy named Hitler. And they start negotiating a, 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 a pact. And that picture that I've got there is a picture of Prime Minister Chamberlain, who famously came back from that meeting, waving these papers, saying, I have a promise of peace. Peace in our time is what he famously said. That's the papers that he's waving there for the cameras. 
uh, that's kind of gone down in history as one of the most delusional moments ever uh, by leaders. All right, so God's still good. Like, this is all happening. They're, they're seeing the sounds of the, the rattling of war is, 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 is happening. But then God is so good. He shows up they, another month-long revival at the BCW. God is so good. And, and guys, Lou and I were just briefly talking about this last night. We never want to miss the visitations, the moments of visitation, and the, and the cultivating the presence of God in our communities. Otherwise, you'll get stuck in the grind of prayer. And it, as things get harder and harder, it's, it's like the goal is to make the gears of hell grind hard, not for our gears to get rusty and grind hard. Because something's coming, but God's so good to oil the wheels. Love that. So he's month-long revival at the BCW. Well, check out what happens. This is so crazy to me. Uh, That emperor from Abyssinia, he goes into exile. He appeals to the League of Nations only to discover that it is utterly powerless. It was an idea that had absolutely no authority to change anything. And so Emperor Selassie ends up in exile in England. He, in, eventually, he bought a house in Bath. I've been there. I snuck onto the property. I got in trouble. <laughs> but I had to film it for the, for the movie. <laughs> Ask for forgiveness, not permission. So he ends up in England, but God, I don't, I don't have time to get into the details. God does something. He finds himself in Swansea, And then he finds himself at the Bible College of Wales. The man that they had been praying for, the emperor of the nation, the last empire on the the planet, that they had been praying for, God brings the emperor to the front door of the BCW. When? During the revival. Emperor Selassie spends two weeks at the BCW in the context of a visitation of the Holy Spirit. And Reese begins to prophesy to him, you will be restored to your throne. He needed that. That man needed that. Because the whole world is about to burn, but God had a prophet who knew the counsel of God, and he brings this emperor to his front door, and in the context of revival, he prophesies, you will be restored to your throne. We're taking on Italy. Isn't this great? I love this. All right, 1939, Hitler invades Poland. Immediately after Soviet Union, they had made a little pact of their own. Soviet Union invades Poland from the other side. <sighs> Britain has to declare war. France has to declare war. All of, the, all of the alliances demanded. And so, boom, World War II begins. And for about a year, they called it the phony war because it didn't look like anything was happening. But things were happening. But Reese had this... Word from the Lord that, that God was going to stop it. Now, this is another interesting moment in the storyline. They were absolutely convinced that God was going to stop it, so much so that he wrote that book, and it's called God Challenges the Dictators. <laughs> Funny that all those years ago, the students had called him a dictator. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. It's been reprinted. If you can get your hands on it, I would recommend it. And... Uh, He prophesied that God's going to stop the war. No general war in Europe. He prophesied it and was in faith for it. He wrote the book about it. And then Germany invaded Western Europe. Now, this is the moment. How many of you have seen the the movie Dunkirk? How many of you saw the movie Darkest Hour? I told David last week, I should not teach and we should just watch the movie Darkest Hour. Gary Oldman won the Academy Award for Best Actor for playing Winston Churchill in that film. That movie is about this moment on the timeline 
when Germany invades uh, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, I'm sorry. And so that's when the uh, British Expeditionary Force gets rolled all the way back to that town in Dunkirk, but they're stuck on the beach. Watch those two movies back to back. Watch Dunkirk and then watch that Christopher Nolan movie, Dunkirk. I'm sorry, watch uh, uh, Darkest Hour and then watch the, the Nolan movie, uh, Dunkirk, and watch them back to back. Binge watch it. So at the sa- right after that same time, Italy invades southern France. Right after that, the Battle of Britain. A lot of people have heard of the Battle of Britain. This was a, a, a prolonged air campaign where Germany was basically like wiping out uh, uh, London and all of the surrounding areas. It was just nightly bombings. And, and there were four different waves of this. And uh, this is the stories of the RAF. Lou, can I have you actually jump up real quick and just tell what happened in 04 with, with that word? This is the most profound message I think I've ever sat under. Because it tells you where we are. Okay. So, and uh, this, mess, this, this is what I'm telling you right now. Back then, in 2004, God gave us a word to do, pray 50 days and 50 nights for a pro-life president and for the ending of abortion. Now you've got to understand this. You've got to understand. I'm looking back. That was all preview to try to begin to train us for the hour we are now in. And for 50 days and 50 nights, we prayed. And I preached to those kids beforehand. And I said to them, the elections belong to you. You are responsible to win the re- elections in prayer. You must, I'm quoting from Reese Howells, you must do more than the voters. You will know if you won the battles of the principalities and powers for life by who gets elected. And I said, and I taught him on Daniel chapter 10, where they fasted, where he fasts 21 days and shifts history. And I taught him about the battle for Britain, how the Air Force of Britain actually defeated the Air Force of the Luftwaffe, the German Luftwaffe, and that actually, had they not won the battle in the skies, like Reese Howells, they would would have lost Great Britain to the German armies. And I told them, because what... What Churchill did when the RAF defeated the Luftwaffe with an amazing disproportion of planes and everything. When the RAF won, Churchill was so moved, speaking to one of the generals of his forces, he says, I am so moved, I cannot speak. In the realm of human conflict, Never has so much been owed by so many to so few concerning the ones that won the battle, their their RAF. And I said to those kids, you are the RAF. You are the Royal Air Force. It will be said of you, I prophesy, it will be said of you that you are the Royal Air Force. Never has so much been owed by so many to so few On the 47th night of day and night prayer in Colorado Springs, which I've got to believe this is connected to that. Do you see what I'm saying? On the 47th night, day I met a man in Colorado Springs that never met him, but his books are actually the ones that led us on the journey for uh, praying for America. I asked him to come and preach. I told him nothing what I had said. He preached a message. I don't even remember what he preached. But on the 47th night, at the end of his message, he suddenly stops. He points to these kids and says, You are the RAF. Never has so much been owed by so many to so few. So this is that moment that that's talking about. The... the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, was outnumbered at least four to one. And this is like the dog fights, you know, like where they're, the Spitfires are fighting, you know, the, the, the German planes. And, and, uh, but something else was going on beyond just Britain having really good pilots. 
at the end at the end of the campaign like one more run and Hitler's got it one more run and this is actually in the book Reese Howe's Intercessor the story that was revealed is this massive uh, bombing wave of planes is coming in now What's really interesting, too, about Britain is they had this really crude, brand new thing called radar that they had strung up around the, the perimeter of the island. It's a, I believe that this is a, a, it's a spiritual picture of what we're called to do is to be having ears that can hear what the Spirit is saying, to, to know what's coming in advance so that this is what they would do. The radar would go off. The, the Germans are coming from this direction. The pilots are living on the airstrip. Guys, this is what we have to do. Is we, have to, it, we can't wait till Sunday to get to church. We need pilots that will live on the airstrip so that when the radar goes off, in a moment's notice, you can get in the plane, and the goal is to get as high as you can as fast as you can. Because whoever's got the high ground commands the field. So they've got radar. The radar goes off. This massive air force from Germany is coming in. And Churchill is in the command center and they're watching it. And it's coming and it's coming and it's coming. And then all of a sudden it turns and leaves for no reason. This was it. This, one more run and they've got it. Then, then Hitler just has to bring... Troops across on barges across the English Channel. They turn, and that's it. That's the end of the Battle of Britain. And there's no explanation as to why they turn. I have read in other sources, German pilots gave testimony later that said that as they were coming in, they look and ahead in the skies, the sky is filled with British airplanes. And they had no idea where the reinforcements had come from. So they turn and they leave in fear. Other accounts say that when they would be in the dogfights and they're fighting the plane, sometimes they would shoot the pilot and they would see the pilot slump over dead. But then somebody else would be in the cockpit flying the plane. <laughs> no, this is real. What is going on? Somebody has to win the air battle. It's incredible stuff, guys. Reese said it best. He, he said uh, war is the best time to test the Bible to see if it's real because we are in one ourselves. It's, it's do or die. We don't know this. Your generation hasn't tasted this. You don't know what it means to do or die. Right now, it's do or Netflix. I'm sorry. You, it's an easy target, man. That's red meat right there. <laughs> I'm a happy guy. I really am. Okay, Battle of Britain. They win the Battle of Britain. There's an angel, right? He's going to jump in that airplane and fly a spitfire. It's great. Isn't that a weird idea that an angel would be in a cockpit? <laughs> like, he's like, shoot. That's so cool. <laughs> Trying to figure out how to reenact that for the movie. <laughs> so the Dunkirk evacuation was a great victory in prayer. God immediately, immediately tests them. Not only is London getting peppered and destroyed, Swansea gets bombed. All, all of the port towns are getting bombed. Swansea was a big port town. So where the BCW is, is getting hammered by the Luftwaffe. It's getting bombed. The whole downtown area of Swansea was completely leveled. In the trailer, you know the old lady that's talking, saying it was a cruel time? Her, her name is Pearl Ebenezer. It's a great name. Pearl, I didn't know it till I was interviewing her. She was in the grammar school at the BCW during the Swansea Blitz. And as a child, would have to walk through the rubble to get to the school and she said it was the most amazing thing. She said every building downtown got leveled. Not one brick left on another. The only, two, two structures were untouched. The big church and a revival mission. See, when, when the church wasn't on board with the Welsh revival, 
missions started popping up, and all they would do is do revival meetings. They were, it was like parachurch is what we would call it today. So the church didn't get hit, but one of the, the missions was still standing, but they had painted massive letters on the wall of this mission. What think thee of Christ? <laughs> so the whole city is leveled, except for this phrase. <laughs> and everybody saw it. So God tested them. You know, not one building on the BCW got hit by a bomb. One shell fell on the campus, and it was a dud. How much you want to bet it wasn't a dud when the plane dropped it? All right, so they win the Battle of Britain, and God speaks to Reese. Russia needs to get involved. And so they start praying, Lord, bring Russia into the war and deal with communism. In the meantime, Italy is defeated in Ethiopia and Haile Selassie is restored to his throne. He, gets, he goes back to Abyssinia. Does anybody want to guess what the first thing was that he did when he got back to his throne? He sent a telegram to Reese Howells, thanking him for his prayers. Isn't that incredible? God, God will weave the storylines of your life. Guys, I want to challenge you today to long-term obedience in a single direction. Don't worry about how much of the world you're going to miss out on in the process. God will bring, he'll bring it to your doorstep. I'm very passionate about this. All right, so Hitler gets the brilliant, I'm joking, idea. Reese had prayed, Lord, bring Russia into the war. Hitler decides to invade the Soviet Union going into winter. Learns nothing from Napoleon. And uh, in his arrogance says, we're, we're going to prove that it can be done. I think that the prayer meeting put that idea in Hitler's head. It was a prayer meeting just like this. So now here's what you want, I want you to see here is, is there's, there's a conflict. God gives revelation in the prayer meeting. Intercessors pray and then the activities of earth bend and turn based on how they pray. If you don't pray, it's going to just keep going. But if you get revelation that this, this shouldn't happen, and you do pray and intercede, events turn. So they win the Battle of Britain, and they turn Hitler away. God brings Russia into the mix because Hitler gets turned there. He loses horribly. Three million German soldiers die frozen. But it wasn't, it, 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 it was going poorly. It looked like Mas Moscow was going to be taken. And so in the prayer room, you'll read it in the journal. Reese, he prayed, he comes in and he says, the Lord says, pray that Moscow will not fall. God told Reese to pray that. It, guys, you understand that's how it works. Like, God's not just going to like sovereignly wave a wand and do this stuff for us. God told Reese Pray that Moscow doesn't fall. And so they, rocket science here, okay? We pray that Moscow doesn't fall. Moscow doesn't fall and, and Hitler loses. That was on October 19th. Just for reference, Japan uh, bombed Pearl Harbor there in December of 1941. This, all this story and the U.S. just enters the war right now. This was the great pain of Churchill, you know, through all of this is like we just, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't get in the mix. All right. Now, during these years, uh, uh, Hitler and Mussolini and the axis of power, they start marching through northern Africa. And this is going on for a couple of years. And when that happened, the Lord, what we saw... Uh, by revelation, is that this is how the enemy was going to threaten Palestine. 
This is how the enemy is going to take what he called the Bible lands. So they turn their attention to praying uh, against uh, the Axis powers in northern Africa. And it was during those days, uh, it's, they get all the way to Egypt. Guys, they're at the doorstep. They're in Egypt. And Reese comes in and says, the enemy is not to take Alexandria. And they pray and they intercede, just like we were praying for Afghanistan. It's like that kind of stuff. The enemy is not to take Alexandria. And guess what? He fails in Alexandria. Again, the enemy gets turned. Then Hitler says, I'm going to go after the Soviet Union again. And it's called the Battle of Stalingrad. And this was... Even more serious because this is further south, close to the Caucasus Mountains. And Reese looked at it and he said, if they take Stalingrad, all they got to do is hop over that and they're going to take the Bible lands from the north. See, the whole thing had shifted to now they're praying for the Jews and they're praying for the Bible lands. And so they pray for the Battle of Stalingrad and it goes on and on and on. And it looks like it's within Hitler's grasp and it's not going well. And the, the journal just records uh, on July 4th that the intensity of the conflict, uh, that we met it with that level of intensity in the spirit. That's like you hear those phrases like when he would come into the prayer meeting and say, don't let those boys on the front do more than you're doing here in the prayer room. Like they're meeting, like the, the intensity of the hour demanded it and they didn't shrink back from it. So I want you to see those four in context. 1943, they totally surrender, access the power surrender in North Africa. Then the Allies invade Italy. Now, this is a fun story because it ties in with Colorado Springs. Is that uh, Reese comes into the meeting one night and says, the Lord tells me that, that we're in a precarious place and we need to pray for the soldiers at Salerno. There is a crisis in Salerno. There had been no news about it. So they pray that evening. And, at, and that night, the news came over the radio that the, sol the invasion of Italy, they got stuck in Salerno on the beach, and the, uh, uh, the uh, Axis powers were just hammering them. And bombs overhead and everything. It's, it's really bad. And it looked like they were going to be stopped. And so they were praying and interceding that night. And then all of a sudden, like, they just knew that the victory was won. They were released, and they, they knew that there was an assurance and faith that the, 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 that the victory was won. And it's recorded, said they looked at the clock, and it was 11 p.m. They wrote it down. Well, now, that's recorded in the book because uh, uh, the next, like, a couple of days later, a reporter that was embedded with the soldiers, an article came out, and he said, we were stuck on the beach, we were being hammered, when all of a sudden... Everything stopped. Everything went quiet. The bombs stopped falling. And he said, and I looked at my watch, and it was 11 p.m. And he said, we, we, the, he said, we have no idea why they stopped, but we were able to gather our strength through the night, and this is what led to the successful invasion of Italy. Now, the way it ties into Colorado Springs is, Dick Eastman was very moved by the story. It's called the, the headline that he wrote was called The Miracle of Salerno. So Dick, years later, decades later, Dick re recounts this Reese Howes story in his book, No Easy Road. And he gets a letter one day uh, from a minister down in Texas, and he says, I just read your book, and he said, I had to reach out to you because I'm, I, I, he said, I, I just am so struck by God in this. He said, in 1943, I was a soldier and, and with, that invaded Italy. And he said, I was stuck on the beach in Salerno. And the bombs were going off overhead. And he said, I didn't know God, but I cried out because I, I was sure I was about to die. And, and he said, I said, I said, God, if you save me from this situation, I'll give my life to you. And he said, immediately the bomb stopped, and I looked at my watch, and it was 11 p.m. Wow. So Dick Eastman has that letter. The guy comes home, goes to seminary, becomes a pastor. This is crazy stuff, isn't it? Obedient. 
Long-term obedience in one direction. All right, so everybody knows about D-Day in 1944. That's when uh, the Allies invade uh, in France and Belgium. They start pushing towards, it, it's a sprint to Berlin. Now we're just going to, I'm, I'm jumping some of those events. Uh, Mussolini dies two days before Hitler commits suicide. And then uh, we drop uh, two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. At the same time, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan, and they said, whoop, we're out. And so Japan surrenders. That marks the end of World War II. Now let me read you something. I, I wanted you to see those four orange quotes on the top there. These four key battles that these intercessors were used to pray into. Now, if you read this book, you may not catch this. But I wanted you to see it, the progression of faith and how they were praying into those events to turn the events in the way that the counsel of God said to turn them. Months later, with these four great prayer battles behind them, the invasions of Britain, Alexandria, Moscow, and Stalingrad, the college personnel were much interested to see an article published in the press by the military commentator, General J.R.C. Fuller, in which he gave four reasons for the impending doom of the Nazis. Four reasons. Number one, Hitler's four, well here, Hitler's four blunders, he called them, number one, uh, blunder number one, was missing the chance to invade Britain. That was the Battle of Britain. Number, blunder number two, his failure to attack Egypt and gain Alexandria. Blunder number three, everything in the Russian campaign depended on the fall of Moscow. Yes, Hitler turned away to, uh, yet Hitler turned away to other objectives. Blunder number four, Hitler's final mistake, the great attack on Stalingrad. My point is this, I wanted you to see those because there's a lot of battles going on. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of actors and players, many, many dynamics. And you listen to Fred and you see like, oh, I don't know, man, how do I make sense of all these cycles spinning and turning? And how do I pick which one to do? And how do I do all of it? You can't do all of it, but be responsible with the parts that by revelation God does give you because this company had these four key pieces and they won all four battles and these are the four great blunders that led to the doom of the Nazis. I just want you to see it. Be responsible and faithful with the peace that you, that you do get. Don't shrink back from it. Don't abandon it. And at the first chance of it being hard, quit. All right, I'm almost done. You're all thinking about lunch, aren't you? This was really one of the main blunders of prayer. Blunders? Why did I say? I, got, the word, I was stumbling over those words, blunders. Burdens. This was really one of the main burdens of prayer at the college because long before God had revealed to them that this was not just a European war, but that through it in the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. I'm putting that in quotes because I want you to connect it back to Acts 13, right? With David. You're going to serve your generation by serving the counsel of God. This is what Reese said. In the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, the Jews would return to Palestine, the gospel go out to every creature, and the Savior be able to return. Do you understand that these are the two great conditions that must be fulfilled? Can you just hit pause on your politics for a minute? Hit pause on your social justice just for a minute and understand that in the determinate counsel of God, these two conditions must be fulfilled. The gospel has to go to every creature and the Jews have to be in Palestine. Then Jesus can come back. What do you do with that? My politics doesn't agree with that. All right, so let's take a step back. There's the timeline, World War I, World War II. I just want you to see these two little stakes in the ground. He starts the school, and he gets the every creature vision. And it's during these days that they're understanding these two pistons are, are what are driving the, the chariot of Jesus coming back. 
the gospel going to every creature, and the Jews in Palestine. They're praying through all of these years for the Jews. He's, he remembers Maurice Rubin, the converted Jew, who shared the, the, the beauty of the, the sacrifice of the cross with him. And he remembers the Jews that were being slaughtered in Europe, and he bought one of the, the estates just to take in Jewish orphans and refugees. He remembers all of this. He remembers Haile Selassie, these Ethiopian Jews. God's got a purpose for them. Something's going on. But here's what it looks like now in the timeline. So for many, many, many years, the Ottoman Empire controlled the Bible lands. World War I ended that. When, the, when Britain routed them, they then beca- it became their responsibility. It's called the British Occupational Mandate. Britain now is in control occupying the Bible lands. After World War II, there's a lot of question about what do we do with these Jews? I would recommend that you watch a documentary called Long Way Home, where it basically the ones that survived, the ones that got liberated from the prison camps, it sounds like a great thing, right? It is. It's a great thing that, that they got liberated, but you know what? They went back home and everyone was like, we thought you were dead. And they couldn't go back. They still, the anti-Semitism was still alive and well. And they they have nowhere to go. They survived Hitler's gas chambers only to still have nowhere to go. You know what we did with them? We're like, well, we got these prison camps here. You don't know this, do you? We put our guards at the prison camps and we let the Jews move back in and stay there. We put them back in those prison camps. So these years, these like two, two and a half years after World War II ends, they're still in prison camps and we're the guards. And nobody knows the answer. No one has an answer for the Jew question. If I could say it that way, you understand what I mean. Like, what do we do with these Jews? They didn't die. (laughs) Britain, you know, there, there's all kinds of negotiating going on. Britain announces that they're going to evacuate. Reese rejoices because in the wake of World War II, the League of Nations was totally powerless, so they chucked that and they created the United Nations. And they got together in San Francisco and they started trying to figure out what are we going to do with the Jews and it's in November 27th of 1947 that the, the United Nations votes on the creation of a state for the Jews in Palestine. So that's, I, I wanted you to see that there. So let's zoom in on that part right there. I'm almost done. So there's the United Nations are formed right after World War II. November 27, 1947, the United Nations votes to establish the state of Israel. There is a comment in the book about this. Reese said, one of the greatest days for the Holy Ghost in the history of these 2,000 years. A few months later, May 14th, Israel declares independence. Guess what happened? War! Literally within hours of Israel declaring independence, Egypt, the Transjordan, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and North Yemen all pounce to wipe them out. Guess what? They lost. It's another great miracle. You understand that the Jews are the only people group in all of human history to exist without their own place for 2,000 years and be reconstituted and their language and culture is intact. That is a miracle. Now, why do you think that is? It's because God has promises that are not yet fulfilled. Reese lived in a time when they were literally praying biblical prophecy into being. What if we're doing the same thing right now? What if we're in a moment where biblical prophecy... Yeah. 
what, what do you have a hand on right now? I don't think we even realize. They were literally praying biblical prophecy into being. February 1950, Reese dies. And I'll say this, he died and his son comments later that the, the weight of the intercession for Israel was too much for the human frame. And his, his son believed that it was that final intercession that, that, that that's why he died. He, he just, days, he couldn't get out of bed, but he would just lay there in the divine presence. Within an hour of Reese dying, his son Samuel took over as director of the BCW and carried those principles of intercession forward for decades to come, praying through the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Gulf War, 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 war. It just keeps going. I do want to read this. In the past, Reese Howes had trained a team of intercessors ready to intercede for the gospel to go to every creature. And if at any point in the future the devil attacked the advance of the kingdom of God around the world, it would be their responsibility to act in intercession. Now Samuel Reese Howells had to lead them. But he said this, he said, I don't want to be regarded as his servant's successor, said Samuel. I feel we are all his successors. So much depends. We're talking about Reese for a reason. and So much hinged on him, his relationship with God, his listening ear, right? His abiding. But at the moment that he dies, his, his literal physical son says, no, we are now all the successors of Reese Howes. Samuel carries this for decades to come. And then he died in 2004. Does anybody know anything else that happened in 2004? I, I think things have happened all over the globe, but I know this, that in the fall of 2004, Lou gathered 50, for 50 days and nights here in Colorado Springs, and God released a prophecy that they are the RAF. At the same time that Samuel, the son of Reese, dies, God raises up another company. Because it's not about Reese and it's not about Samuel. We are all the successors of Reese House. You are the successor of Reese House. What will you do next? That's Richard Mayton and his wife, Christine. They were there at the school. Now, Richard came in in 1950 after Reese had died, but Christine was there as a student during World War II. And they were telling us these stories about how they would pray and they needed to pay their tuition and they would pray and the money would come. And then during the war, they needed firewood and they would pray and a tree would fall down and they would have firewood. And it was all of these like really practical ways of growing in faith and learning the principles of intercession. And then Richard, he's the one teaching, and he, and he looks at Christine. He goes, Christine, do you have anything you want to share? And she's like, oh, I don't have anything to say. You've said it all. And he's like, no, please come and share. And she gets up, and she stands there for a moment. Elise has stepped out. She was in the room when this happened. And Christine goes, I remember one time we were all in the prayer room, and the United Nations was going to take a vote about what to do about Israel. She was in that meeting. For years, I've challenged people saying, what would it have been like to be in that prayer meeting, praying biblical prophecy into being? And then God brings me face to face with her, and she was in the meeting. And she said, we came in and we prayed and we had a breakthrough and we had an assurance of faith that it, God was going to put it through. And then the news, oh, I'm, you're over here too. Yeah. Anyway, uh, she, she was there. She was in the room too. And, uh, 
And she said, we prayed, and then the news came over the radio that they had taken the vote, and it didn't go through. Wait a minute, God, you said. That's a good one, right? God, you said. And I, and I said, what did you do? And, and she said, you know, Reese said, well, let's go back and pray some more. Brings them back into the prayer room, and they pray into the night. When they felt like they had the release, they went to bed. They got up in the morning only to hear on the radio that the, the world leaders in San Francisco had come back together and voted again. And the second time, it went through. It's incredible stuff, guys. This is Reese's headstone. I wanted you to see it. It reads, you ever wondered, like, what's going to be on my headstone? I have ideas. <laughs> I love what Reese says. He put, he put this scripture on it. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. What an epitaph. He staggered not at the promise of God. I'll end with this. You were born for such a time as this. God didn't sneeze and you fell out accidentally in the timeline. Now what am I going to do, right? You were born for such a time as this. The question you need to answer is, what is God doing in your generation? Are you praying the kinds of prayers that redraw maps? Every boundary in society is being challenged right now. Are you praying the kinds of prayers that redraw those lines? What happens when prayer fails? According to Reese, only intercession will avail. That's it. I'm sorry that went so long. Sorry, not sorry.